Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome back to my channel. I of course am Brendan. Some people call me Brendan Picante. Some people call me the Chili Dork. Ding! But whoever I am, today I wanted to talk to you about the five domesticated species of peppers. This has been a video that I've wanted to make for like a year. I've worked for about two months on it. I'm really excited. It's packed with information, like a lot of information. And so there's timestamps down in the doobly-doo, so you can come back in case you don't want to sit for the entire 25 minutes, which I understand. But I'm really excited about this video. Um, I, I hope uh, a lot of people take away a lot from it. I think species identification is really important as a grower because it helps me understand what I'm growing, obviously. If I have a plant and I don't know what it is, at least if I can identify the species, I can tell myself what it's not going to taste like or what it's not going to be like. In my years, I have yet to find a pepper over 100,000 on the scale that's not a chinense. So if I have an unknown plant and I can tell it's not a chinense, I know it's, there's no way it's going to be a super hot. So at least I have that piece of information. Stuff like that. If any of you know of a pepper pod that's over 100,000 that's not a chinense, tell me. I'm interested. But the point is, I'm really excited about this video. I hope you guys like it. And I'm going to go to a trail in the woods to start talking to you about all of this stuff. See you soon. So the five domesticated species. <clears throat> First, let's start out with a bit of a broader picture. All peppers are in the Solanaceae family of plants, uh, which means they're related to, it's also called nightshade, and they're related to nightshade. Potatoes, tomatoes, eggplants, tobacco, things like that. And of that family, they are in all peppers, hot, sweet, all of them, are in the genus Capsicum. Chili nomenclature is confusing uh, around the world. I mean, in some parts of the world, bell peppers are called capsicums, even though that's their genus name. But anyway, so they're in the genus Capsicum. And below that, of course, is species. Now, depending on when or what you've read over the years, like me, there's anywhere from 25 to 40 wild species of capsicums, but there are generally recognized to be five domesticated species of capsicum. And those five are what we're going to talk about today. One expert, who I respect a lot, says there's four. I've read one guy who says there's three. But for our intents and purposes today is five domesticated species. And those are capsicum annuum, capsicum chinensi, capsicum baccatum, capsicum pubescens, and capsicum frutescens, frutescens. You're going to hear me probably pronounce these all whatever, and you will hear other people pronounce them whatever. But that's just what we're going to deal with today. At home, I'm growing three species this year. I normally grow four. But this year I only have three. And uh, I have annuum, chinensi, and frutescens. And I'm going to use those plants as visual aids along with some pods I picked up, you saw earlier. But I'm first going to talk about the bacatum and the pubescens because I'm not growing them. And they're also the least common to find in the States. So today I'm going to start with pubescens. 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 I call it pubescence because I think pubic is funny. I'm doing that because admittedly that is the species I know the least about, not just because I've only ever grown one plant of it, but it's also not very commercially available in the States. I can find fresh pods at some local Spanish speaking grocery stores, but I will not find them anywhere, not yet, in a regular supermarché. Of the five domestics, I think pubescents, pubescents, whatever is the easiest, to, uh, easiest plant to identify. The plant itself is filled with hairy leaves and hairy stems, which is why it gets its name as it does. And it grows more out than up. So you can tell just by looking, if you have a furry plant, it's probably pubescence. There are, I have grown two annuum plants that were also hairy that weren't pubescent. So one was called moshi and one's called, of course, goat's weed, probably the more popular of the two. But the telltale sign of a pubescence is the flower. It's a deep, beautiful purple. While there are annuums that have purple flowers, pubescence all have purple flowers. I also want to stress real quick 
that most, if not all, of what I tell you today is general. There are exceptions to almost everything I tell you in every species. Some of that's evident in my own plants at home. But for our conversation today, everything I'm telling you is pretty much a generalization. If it gets to the point where it grows out and you have fruit, or you went out and you bought some fruit that you don't know what it is, say at a farmer's market, the telltale sign of a pubicin's fruit, here's got a couple here. These are uh, called the manzano or yellow manzano. Manzano translates to apple. And as you can see, these resemble apples. However, this one doesn't resemble an apple. But this looks more like most of the pubicins that I've seen grow, especially the purples and the, or the reds and the brown. The most famous pubicins are gonna be the manzano and something called the ricotto. The ricotto you're gonna find as the red ricotto. Uh, these, these are also called yellow ricotto. There's something else called locoto. Pubicins are from South America. All chilies are from South America, technically. Um, all, they all originate in what is now considered Northern Bolivia. At least latest research that I've read has it all originated there and they spread out. Wait, what does that even mean? That they all come from South America or Bolivia or what did I say? What I mean by that is the ancestral plants, the ones that predate human use, even before birds spread them everywhere, which is something I bring up later, the origin of all chilies all comes from what is believed a little area in northern Bolivia and South America. The, all the wilds start there, way before we domesticated them. But the telltale sign of a pubescent is the seeds. The seeds are black. They are the only species with black seeds. Uh, these are also incredibly hot, otherwise I would take a bite of it. Some of these range from 60 to 100,000 on the scale. And while I don't find their flavor too enhancing, at least not the yellows, the heat, the heat burns so differently too. Also, another note on flavor, I can't really speak to red ricottos or red anything in the pubescents. I grew one plant in 2015 and it didn't yield much, and to be honest, I kind of forgot what it tastes like. However, the yellow manzano or manzana or yellow ricotto or whatever, I think lacks in the flavor department. I really view it as kind of like a dull apricot flavor with a hint of the classic capsicum flavor, if that makes sense. I think if you're gonna use it in a hot sauce, you're gonna have to pump it up a bit with a bunch of other stuff. Uh, Lost Capital Foods does an amazing Manzano sauce. If you haven't checked out Lost Capital, check them out. And I've never tried any of the brown ricottos. I think those will probably be good. But that's, that's what I know for the flavor on that particular species. The heat of a pubicins will last a lot longer after you're done eating it. You might recall my video about capsaicinoids. If you don't, that's fine. Um, very briefly, capsaicin is what makes chilies hot, but actually that breaks down even further into things called capsaicinoids. And while they've isolated over 20, five capsaicinoids are prevalent in most chilies. And each one of those burns a different part of your tongue differently, which is why different chilies burn differently. You'll have a tie type and it'll burn right away and dissipate quickly. You'll have a habanero that doesn't burn right away but it hits you in the back of the throat later. You'll have a pubicins that takes a second but lasts forever. You'll have an annuum that burns the top of your mouth, for example. So the heat on these lasts for a long time. They're crazy. Pubicins have a good cold weather tolerance and they have a great high altitude tolerance. They won't survive a winter per se, but they will survive colder temperatures that would slow the growth of other plants. No chili survives a winter. However, all pepper plants are perennials in the right climate. I've seen photos of plants that are 10, 12 years old. I've seen plants, photos of plants that are 30 feet high. It's just, it's insane. That is a brief rundown of pubicins. The next species I want to talk about is Capsicum bacatum, or bacatum, or bacatum. I have heard this pronounced many ways by many people. I know that there's a right way to pronounce all of these things, but Bacatum is a species that is widely unavailable in the states as far as fresh produce is concerned. And although you can't find fresh bacatum right now, you can at some Spanish-speaking grocery stores find pureed, dried, 
pickled. And frozen baccata, which is awesome. I'm not growing any this year, and I don't have any pods that I can show you, but I do have the internet, and I will show you some photos as I go along. One of the species indicators for Bacatum is going to be the flower. It absolutely has one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful flower of all the capsicums. It's got beautiful little mustard yellow spots on every petal. They are just gorgeous. They are the only species that has that. So if you're growing something, you don't know what it is, you can't tell by the leaf structure, because after a while it does, some leaf structures look similar to others. Check out your flowers, especially with Bacatum. Bacatum. Once the plant grows out, if you miss the flowers, let's say you, you know, some reason didn't, didn't look, I don't know. The fruits themselves have really long stems and the calyx goes without, it goes more of a cap rather than sticking out like some other species, which you'll see later in the video. One of the most important things about species identification when it comes to pods is where the stem, also called the pedicel, connects to the calyx and in some, some ways called the cap. And there's a, there's a thing called annular constriction that really makes like other species incredibly easy to identify just by looking at the fruit. Bacatum has no constriction. And Bacatums are native in Peru. They're really important in Peruvian cooking, such as ceviche and things like that. They have a heat range that goes from zero to something called like an aji dulce, which literally translates to sweet pepper. All the way up to 50, 60,000 in some cases. I've, I've heard 100,000. It depends on many things, mostly growing conditions. The most famous bacatums, bacatums, whatever, are going to be the ahi amarillo, uh, the ahi limon, also called ahi lemon or lemon drop, and the ubatuba, which is also called mad hatter, bishop's crown, uh, Christmas bell. And has one of the most unique shapes in all, and they're just delicious, but one of the most unique pod shapes I've ever seen. A popular misconception about the Cadams, by the way, and this is something that drives, personally drives me crazy, but that's just because I care so much about it, is that ahi means this species, like an ahi pepper is a bacatum, and it's not. Ahi, the word, A-J-I, ahi is an old Caribbean language, Taino, T-A-I-N-O, it's the, their word, ahi is just the word for the fruit that we call pepper or fruit that people call chilies. That's it. And ahi amarillo translates to yellow pepper. So when people say, I like ahi types, I'm like, yeah, you like pepper types. Okay, that's what we're here for. What do you mean? And while I know what they mean, and I'm just kind of being petty, ahi does not mean bacatum. Ahi translates to pepper. When you see somebody say ahi type, you know what they're trying to say, but now you know what ahi really means. Catums have a particular sweetness to them that I find really unique. They're gaining more popularity in the States every single year, especially since the Mad Hatter is readily available in a lot of seed catalogs. They take forever to ripen, however. The Sugar Rush Peach is another popular one, but they take forever to ripen. And by that I mean I've sowed the Catum seeds with my everything else, annuum, and chinensky and all that stuff. And after my garden is done for the year and I brought plants inside, only then do some of my bacatums finally start to ripen. I had an ahi amarillo that didn't ripen until November. It was insane. So they take forever to ripen. So when you get a sugar rush peach and you're like, this isn't really that good, you, it, you probably didn't let it ripen enough. And the reason why I say probably is because I absolutely did that the first year I ever grew them. Once I let them finally ripen, sugar rush peach is one of the best peppers I've ever had. Catums have a very unique burn to them, and I personally, I think their pith, where the, the heat is, you know, I think their pith tastes kind of soapy. I like to cut out the pith, 50% of it maybe, so I can get the flavor of the pepper while still getting some of the heat. I just don't like that soapy flavor. I like the taste of the bacatum flesh. It's really good, but I don't like the taste of a spicy bacatum. I just don't. Brazilian starfish is another popular one that's absolutely fantastic. Oh my god, it is so hot out here. I hope you have questions in the comments below. I'll pre I'm prepared to answer all that I can. While I do know a lot about peppers, I've grown 400 different strains. I'm on my 12th season. I'm by no means an expert, and I don't know everything. But if you have anything you want to know that I didn't clarify, if I can answer it, I absolutely will. Next up, I'm going to move on to annuum. 
Okay, now I am home and I'm in a much more appropriate shirt. I want to talk to you about capsicum annuum. I actually have an annuum here, annuum here, one back here you can't even see, so whatever. A few annuum pods, but anyway, capsicum annuum is the most widely grown and distributed species of the domestics in the world. It's got such perennial favorites as, you know, the bell and all the variants of the bell, jalapeno, serrano, New Mex type, or what most people call an Anaheim, cayenne, poblano, fresno, and then ones from around the world like alma paprika and shishito and things like that. And those are just some, you know, incredibly common ones. There's thousands and thousands of annuums. Annuums are mistakenly named because the uh, person who discovered or named it thought they were annual, but like I said earlier, all peppers are perennial in the right climate. Annuums have a range of flavors, a range of shapes. There's no way to pinpoint anything about them. There's a few species identifiers that help you identify your plants, uh, namely the flower growth habit of the leaves, the way the, the how many flowers per node and things like that. And then once you, if, if you miss all of that, once you get your fruit, there's a way to tell. Annuums are gonna have a single fruit per node. A node is where your, uh, you, you get an intersection of your stem, as it were. They have white flowers. However, there are some ornamental annuums that have purple flowers and they grow erect. For the most part, annuums grow pendulant, but with ornamentals that you're gonna get a range of colors. And I mean, they're beautiful. They're, they're bred for ornamentation and not flavor. So while all chilies are edible, all of them, even the ornamentals, like I said, they're, they're bred for looks, not flavor. But if I ever grow an ornamental, I just like to powder them up combine them with a little bit of salt and garlic powder and then I have a uh, spicy flavoring because there, there's not a lot of flavor to them. Maybe add some paprika for to, to make up for the terrible flavor of the ornamental. Annuum pod shapes come in all kinds of all ranges. This is just what I bought at Cub earlier today. You know the jalapeno and it's got the bullet end and things like that. Uh, all, any annuum is edible when it's green. All green annuums are unripe and will ripen to any other color like red, yellow, orange. The vitamin C level in all peppers is higher than any other fruit or vegetable, but when you get it ripened to red, not only is the vitamin C high, but you got a vitamin A level that's through the roof as well. A lot of good level of fiber. These are just fantastically healthy. Chilies are probably the most magical thing on earth. Annuum flavors range all over the place. The reds have a really good sweetness to them, I think, um, but some of them, like some of the Syrian reds and some of the Turkish reds have a particular sweetness that is just mind blowing. Now, when it comes to the plants, you can see, like I said before, there's one fruit per node. Here I have a jalapeno and this one is a quote, long hot. This one also has one fruit per node. Notice the flowers are growing up for now, but once they get fruit, they'll hang down. Like I said, they're primarily pendulant. Annuum leaves are gonna be, at least in my experience, smoother and come to a sharper point than say chinensi, which we will see in a moment. I don't really talk much about plant height because that's all completely dependent on what pot you put it in or if it's in the ground. Annuums can grow to be maybe three feet tall if you have a annual version, but you know, they can get all over the place. So that is some annuum plantage. I also wanted to take a second and show off some things I was talking about earlier with pedicles and calyxes with some annuum fruit that I have. As you can see here, and this will be easier to see in a moment, this here is the pedicel. And this here, coming around, this flat thing, is the calyx. A lot of annuums, you can see it's got five points. Um, it's a little easier to see here on Alma Paprika. There's an example of what it looks like. But then you get into some fruit. And the calyx has well, no constriction, which I've talked about earlier, which you'll see in Chinens in a moment. But also this just kind of falls over it like a cap. This is another annuum fruit, very similar calyx to the other two that I showed you. So that's just an example of what 
pedestal and calyx means and what it looks like on some annuums. Next up, I want to talk about Capsicum chinense. I have one here. I have a few chinense plants this year. I grow them every year. The most popular chinense is going to be the habanero, but these days maybe it's the reaper or whatever, maybe the ghost pepper. I'm sure you've heard of all three of those. Chinense gets its name because in the 1700s, when the species was identified, it was discovered in the Caribbean, which is where it's believed to originate from, mostly that area. It was mistakenly thought to be from China. We don't know why. And so it was uh, aptly named the Capsicum chinense. Don't ask, I don't know. Chinense are famous for having the hottest peppers in the world. All the super hots and all the extreme levels of peppers, everything over like 150,000 on the Scoville scale, is going to be in the chinense family or chinense species. You've got, like I said, habanero, ghost. Um, you're also going to have things like the Trinidad perfume and Maldivian heart and Piaf Zinho, which is one that I find to be absolutely delicious. The Trinidad perfume has no heat whatsoever. You also have the habanada, which was bred for about 10 years to be a heatless habanero. And of all the heatless habaneros out there, I think that one has the best flavor. The Chinense have a very distinct aroma, a very distinct flavor that gives it its own little niche. Cut open any Chinense and you're going to get that smell right away. It's a little, what's a good word? I mean, citrusy, smoky with fruit all together. The more red ones have definitely a sweeter tone, like in every single species. And oddly, the reds also generally have the higher heat level. The yellows are going to have less of a heat level. The chocolates are going to have more of an earthy tone to them. That kind of seems like an across-the-board thing. You know, chocolate annuums also have a more earthy tone to them. So I go into a little bit about species identification with the stem and calyx later when I start talking about the fruit. But one of the biggest identifiers in the plants is going to be leaf shape and fruits per node. And let me show you what I mean. So I'm going to show you some chinensi, but I just wanted to kind of show you everybody and give you an example of how like that looks different than that looks different than that looks different than these. Here we have two beautiful chinense plants. Chinense tend to be a little more wider. You know, here's an annuum. Oh, well, you can see in my light. But like I said about chinense, <clears throat> they have a multiple fruit per node. I'll zoom in. And you can see here, there's two flowers coming off one node, and there's little group grouplets, as it were, everywhere. That's one of the telltale signs. I can just tell by looking at the leaves, because they have a wider, fatter, chunkier feel to them. Then when you look here, and you see that these are super th a little thinner. You come over here, and these are even thinner. I but what's funny too is this is also a chinense and it's got a little longer bit to it so there's always going to be exceptions. Going back to these two plants, <clears throat> you can just see how loaded this guy is as I come underneath. And one other thing to point out, it's kind of hard to see today, let's zoom in if I can. In the center there is what's called anthers on the in the center of the flower and on a lot of chinense they're purplish the petals of your flower are going to be white and they can be five petals or six petals that happens to all the plants even on the same plant but the anthers you can look right by my thumb and a lot of chinense are purple a lot of annuums they're yellow the fruit in Chinense is pretty easy to distinguish. Like you saw in the annuum with calyx and stem, also called pedicel. The fruit of a Chinense, as you can see, that ring around, so here's the pedicel and here's the calyx, which is so different than the anum. But you can see this dark ring, that's, that's what I was telling you earlier, is annular constriction. And in Chinense, or Chinense, you know, but I'm going to call it Chinense. 
here and there and everything. It's really easy to distinguish. You'll see that there. You'll see the constriction there. You can see the constriction there. It's just one of the signs that you have chinensi. And I just want to show you that in the fruit. And so lastly, I'm going to talk about frutescens, the last of the five domestics, which actually have some wild traits to them, which leads some researchers to think that there's only four domesticated and these aren't quite fully domesticated yet, which I can see. And what do I mean by that? Well, the wild chilies, they grow erect. They actually grow small little spherical pods. Frutescens are actually conical. So that's one of the reasons they're not quite wild, but the wild chilies would grow in little spheres and then birds would see them. They were red. Wild chilies were all red. They still are. They're still wild chilies. And they would swoop in and they would eat them and they would fly off because birds lack the receptors to detect heat. And so they're perfect uh, receptacles for seed dispersion. And they would come in, they would eat them, fly off, poop them out somewhere, and perfect fertilizer. Mammals teeth destroy seeds, our digestive systems destroy seeds, they make them not viable. So that's believed to be one of the reasons chilies produce capsaicin was to deter mammals, but a lot of modern researchers are thinking that it may be more aligned with deterring fungus and mold and insects, which is something I'll talk about in another video. Anyway, frutescens. Side note, because I totally got off topic and ahead of myself, frutescens However domesticated they were, uh, were domesticated in North and South America. The most famous frutescens, of course, is the Tabasco. Everyone knows that from the, uh, the ubiquitous Tabasco sauce. Um, another more known frutescens is going to be from Brazil called the Malgueta. Possibly Malagueta. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Frutescens tend to have a very sharp forward heat that dissipates rather quickly. I don't think they're very delicious, but they're definitely hot. They definitely hit you right away. So back to what I was trying to tell you. I got frutescence plant here. I got frutescence plant here. I'm going to go in close up and show you some things that help identify them. And then we will move on to probably the end of the video. I know I've taken up a lot of your time and I appreciate all of you for being here. So let's talk about frutescence identification. These aren't frutescens, these are chinenses, but you can see how chinense has a particular feel to it that gives you what it looks like. And then here we have an annuum or annum. Well, the frutescens also have their own vibe, as it were. The leaves are shiny, they're wider on top, come down to a point. So, so do other chilies, but, you know, and to me they have kind of a slightly pubescent feel, not capsicum pubescens, but literally the furry feel slightly, a little scratchy. One of the things that distinguishes it, even though a lot of other species do this, the fruit grows erect. And the flowers come up and come down to a sharp point. But one of the things that makes it really easy to identify, let me zoom in real quick and show you, is that the flowers have a lime green tinge to the petals. You can kind of see it there. And then you can really see it there. Also, I'm going to show you a quick photo right here. But that green is a sign, the purple anthers too. But with the fruits themselves, like I said, they all grow erect. But I'm going to pluck one. These are all immature, but I'm going to pluck one off. And you can see that there's no constriction like there are in other ones. But with the calyx, it just kind of comes down. Like so. No other species looks like that. But that is a couple species indicators of these. God, these are just beautiful, isolating one. So that's an idea of what, how to identify frutescens. I think I'm going to wrap this video up now, so if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go somewhere else and film an outro. So that was my species video. I hope you liked it. I had a lot of fun making it. I'm really excited about everything I taught you guys in it. 
there's a lot to take in. If you have any questions or want anything clarified, by all means, let me know in the comments. If there's anything I left out, and I know I did because there's so much more out there than what I told you all today, ask me about it, I'll let you know. If you have a couple questions that you want me to answer in the Your Pepper Questions Answered videos, I'm all about that. If you like this, go ahead and give me a like, hit the subscribe button, that'd be really cool. Any comments down below help me gain traction so I can teach more people about peppers because that's what this channel is all about. So thank you for watching this, thank you for being here, I appreciate everything. On that note, I'm going to go. So I want you all to be well, inspired to perspire, and I hope you have a lovely however long it is till I see you next. Take it easy.